everyone, it's Granny Lisa. Hi everybody, welcome to the show, Vets Chatting with Granny Lisa. Today I have a very special guest, a good friend of mine that I met through the veteran community, and his name is Greg Murphy, and he is going to be talking about two programs that are super special for all veterans and first responders. So I'm going to go ahead and bring him on, and here we go. I'm new at this, so bear with me, but we got it under control. Yeah, hey, Greg, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, you're looking handsome as usual, so that's always good. And how is your beautiful wife doing? She's very well. She's in the other room, sitting awesome. with my puppy. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. trip. Yeah. I. What kind of dog is he again? He's a Springer Doodle. Springer Doodle. He yeah. is adorable, those big brown eyes. Oh my gosh. And if you guys know, oh, if you don't know uh, Craig, you can look him up on Facebook. He has some wonderful videos of his adventures and his adorable puppy. And you can also ask him any questions about uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So can you please introduce yourself uh, what service you were in, um, the year, what you did, and um, we'll just take it from there. Okay. I was uh, in the Coast Guard, uh, 1979 to 1988. I uh, was a yeoman, uh, did administrative paperwork stuff, um, spent three years at the headquarters in Washington, D.C., and three years in London, uh, based out of the embassy, we were the headquarters for Loran stations. So that's six of the eight years I was in were those two units. What does that mean? It means I didn't move around that much. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, you know, I don't know much about water or about boats or anything like that yeah. even though most of my family was navy um i chose to go army because i'm terrified of the ocean so <laughs> you being coast guard i've seen those videos wild and crazy i can't even imagine i mean you've posted a few of them yourself so yeah um let's talk about because you do two programs like you're not busy enough but the first program is how we originally met. And I'm surprised that still not too many people have heard about the program. And that's No Veteran Dies Alone. And that's through the, um, some VAs have them or do all of them. I'm gonna let you go ahead and explain. Some of them have them. And that's one of the things that I wanted to try to uh, get out to people that there is uh, something like uh, No Veteran Dies Alone. And if they don't have it in their uh, VA hospital, to try and get it in their hospital. I think it's important that other veterans know that there are people like me that do this for those that don't Here we are it. again. Go ahead and start over. We had a little bit of an issue with the, I don't know what they call it, but it makes the circles yeah. delay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> you were talking about, <laughs> you were talking about the VA. Oh, and, uh, you asked if they're in all VAs. Uh, no, they're yes. not. That's one of the things that I wanted to kind of spread uh, through um, doing things like this is to spread the fact that there are people like me that do this for other veterans. Um, I'm just one of many, and uh, I think it's a great program. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we should have it in all VAs, 
and uh, nobody should die alone, you know? And so uh, I was uh, in my early days in the Coast Guard, I was stationed uh, at Coast Guard Station, Fort Lauderdale. And uh, that's when all the Haitians and Cubans were coming in. And we had to deal with a lot of dead bodies and kids and stuff. And, and so I kind of got a little bit uh, used to death. And uh, I was there when my mom died. I was there when my uncle died. And I've been there for other people when they've died. So I've always been able to uh, not get too bothered by death and uh, to be able to be uh, an asset to people at their time of need. Okay, and um, because I'm not sure how it begins, is it that the veteran is in hospice and then they pretty much know when it's getting close to their time, so they go to a, a special room that's just for them and or family members, but most of them, they don't have families. Right. And so that's why you're there. And that's why they're there. They are there specifically to die. Okay, so I understood from the last time we talked that the room is set up very peacefully, yeah, very respectfully. And you had shared before that sometimes he broke up there. Lisa, come back. <laughs> You're breaking up. Damn. Come on. Got full bars, so there go ahead are. and explain. I know it's like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious! I was halfway, and down it's like, it goes, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you gotta come back. I'll yank you back. I don't know how, but I'll get you back. Um, so they come into the room, you get them all comfortable, the nurses. Make sure that they're comfortable. If they're awake, um, how do you guys interact? Um, because, I mean, they understand that they're there to die, or do they not know? Or Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes um, their brains are uh, kind of uh, befuddled. You know, it, they're, uh, they're on a lot of medications, um, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with the uh, their ability to be coherent and in a lot of cases they're not very coherent and uh, many times uh, for a four-hour shift all I'm listening to is the death rattle because that's all there is and, and that's all you can do is to be there um, I think it's important to uh, to touch people and so I hold their hands or I'll feel their foreheads or brush their hair aside to make sure that they know somebody's there. And even though they may be, uh, from what uh, all appearances, totally out of it, sometimes you'll feel them squeeze back on your hand. So they are there. They know that you're somebody's there. And I think that's important. I don't think anybody should go in that last door alone. Did we miss all that? <laughs> I have no idea, but I really think that personal touch yeah. is important. It is. I mean, because I, I mean, I don't know people have different beliefs and we're not going into religions or anything like that, but, yeah. um, I know that they say a hug can, um, bring your endorphins and, and bring happiness to you. So I'm sure just the touch, even at um, the death channel, yeah. is going to um, give some kind of a comfort. Yeah, 
Well, yeah. hopefully, because it's the only chance they're going to have of any comfort in a lot of cases. Right. So, um, now, you are you do four-hour shifts, so yep. that's, that's, that's quite a bit of people that are going to be volunteering to be there and, and do that for that one veteran. Now, what happens... Um, I know that B is one of the uh, supervisors there at the um, VA that you're at. Right. And uh, she had mentioned that there is a very respectful um, ceremony type thing. Yeah. Can you go into that and, and tell the viewers what that encompasses that they can request or well, when the veteran life. when the veteran uh, dies, they'll um, they bring in a blanket or a, a quilt that has the service of that veteran, and they place it on the bed. And as the body is taken down the hallway, all the employees, the nurses, and the uh, doctors all stand on the outside of the room as the person is wheeled through. And she said something about a candle, or not a real candle, but... In the room, they have a candle, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah. Well, how long have you been doing it? Um, I think coming up on two years. Oh, so it's been a while. Yeah. That's... So I've when... Been, I've been volunteering at the VA since probably 2008. We kind of figured out you might have been one of those drivers that was driving yeah. crazy to take me in. Yeah. <laughs> in the shuttle cart. <laughs> <laughs> They're a lot of fun. Yes, they are. I would like to own one myself. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of communities in Arizona where you can go and live, Lisa, and everybody drives around in golf carts. <laughs> that is probably true. Um, the only thing is, is that uh, I'm not in Arizona anymore. I am in <laughs> Montana. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, I know this is weird, but how, because you do have to deal with this. I mean, like you said, you're, you're used to being around death, but it's got to take a toll somewhere emotionally. Well, that's one of the things, Lisa, that uh, I think B mentioned last time is uh, how she handles it. And one of the ways that she handles it is the next day she doesn't remember the person's name. Because of what we do, you have to have some closure. And uh, I think that's a good way of having closure to continuously think about it and to ruminate on death isn't doing anybody any good. No. <laughs> yeah. So I think the whole idea of being able to just, you know, put a, a, a period at the end of their sentence, so to speak, that it's a, it's, it's a good way of handling it. Okay. So when you come home, you have your wife, you have your dog yeah. to decompress and just move on for nice the next table. one. I have very little stress in my life. I'm fortunate that I have a wife that uh, handles all the financial matters. So I don't have to worry about all that. Most everything is paid for. We don't know any money. So uh, we have a lot of time and a lot of love. So I uh, try to do as much as I can for the people that I appreciate the most, our fellow veterans. There aren't many people that do what we did, Lisa. And I think they we continuously should be rewarded throughout our life. <laughs> I agree with you on that. I yeah. totally agree with you because I feel like um, as time is going, that more and more people, our younger generation, is being taught not to respect the veterans. It's just like, oh, <laughs> they don't deserve anything. Yeah. So why should they be a part of anything? Um, the other thing that um, 
you are working on, which I am new to hearing about, is Hometown Hero Outdoors. Yes. And you are currently in the state of Washington, and you are the senior director state for dir that area? State director. Oh, for the state director, yes. Yes, yes. And the founder is the state director in Oregon. He just My got, home state. <laughs> he's uh, still on active duty, and he's a recruiter in Oregon, and he's the director for Oregon. And I was interested in uh, having the group uh, do more in the Pacific Northwest. So when I started talking to him, he asked me if I wanted to run Washington. So like many people, when you do things for others, there's always an opportunity. So I chose this opportunity and I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be great. Awesome. So tell me about the program. What all does, you said it was like in 27 states or something like that? It's in 22 states and 24 states now with the addition of uh, Washington and Oregon. Oh. And uh, it'll probably grow to the rest of the states. It's a pretty big organization, and uh, they've done a lot in their uh, five years. They just celebrated their fifth year anniversary and had a big banquet. <coughs> so that was oh. good. So, oh, and, so you went to that? No, I didn't go to it. I just started this year, really. But in five years, this group has put on 3,028 trips. In five what kind years. Of what Anything kind of trips are they? From uh, hunting trips to canoe trips to bear hunting to paddle fishing, paddle fish fishing. Um, there's a, a deer ranch, Harris Ranch, that uh, veterans can go to. It's just a whole slew of different things. You can pull it up on the website, and uh, there's a list of all the upcoming events. What's their website? It's hometownheroes.org. Okay, and now you said that now, what about um, veterans with disabilities? Do they work with the veterans trying to get them to do outdoor activities too? Or do you pretty much have to be? Um, no, I, do, I don't know about this group uh, particularly, but um, on one of the last uh, events I went on, it was with Warrior Impact. And we had a, uh, a, uh, a wheelchair veteran that went with us. So all the uh, accommodations can be made for people with uh, handicaps. It's just a matter. Oh, that's of, cool. Yeah, it's just a matter of knowing and uh, preparing and uh, having little devices that will aid. Like uh, the trip that I was on, it was a five day raft trip on the Rogue River. And what we did, you've seen those orange uh, plastic fencing Yes. We took that and we put it on the beach so that he could roll his wheelchair on it. And it I would really, not have thought of that. It worked really well. And so he was able to roll up to his tent and roll over to the fire and stuff. It was nice. That is really inventive. Yeah. And and did you guys help him in and out of the now you went down the the Rogue River, which I'm very familiar with, yep. on the um, speed boats. No, we were on rafts. Oh, you did the raft trips? We were floating, yeah. Oh, how exciting. It was beautiful. It was cold, though. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys do any fishing? Um, the guy in the wheelchair actually did, and he caught a steelhead. He's actually the state... Uh, lead for Oregon for the wheelchair games that are coming up later this month. Really? Yeah, I'm a volunteer for that too. <laughs> I did. You, you did. How many volunteer jobs do you have? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> does your wife ever see you? She does. <laughs> 
Oh, well, you know what? I don't know if you ever hear it enough, but thank you. It's much appreciated because like you said, nobody understands a veteran like a veteran. And I'm sure that during those times where you're at the campfire, it's time to be intimate and talk about things and share your well, stories. You know, is that true? Or? Yeah, because it is very true because uh, sometimes you're at ease in those conversations and you're able to bring up conversations with people that you wouldn't bring up with your civilian friends. I don't want to talk exactly. about picking out dead bodies to a civilian. It's not something they should hear about. It's not something they should know about. All they should know is that it gets done and they should respect us. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, I agree. I agree because um, I think the main thing uh, this month is uh, the month on stress, you know, military stress and also first responders, like you said. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really difficult for um, a serviceman, and I mean women or men, um, to come out when they've been in such a structured environment. Yeah. And then you come out into an unstructured, chaotic, real world, and it's overwhelming because where do you go from there? What do you do? And a lot of our Vietnam vets, they were criticized and called baby killers to where our World War II vets, they just, I mean, they were, they got a warm welcome, but they pushed aside a lot of their um, feelings of what happened. They had a job to do, rebuild America. Yeah. And that's what they focused on. So with our desert storm on up to currently, um, where and how are they dealing with things? And that really concerns me with another thing that's close to your heart is our veteran suicide rate. Now they said um, the military or, you know, they said that it's at uh, 44 a day. Yeah. Well, they took that reading from a 2001 uh, poll and they don't even count all of the ways of suicide. So no. to me, it's not an accurate number. What When you have military officers sitting mm -hmm. in the VA parking lot with their VA records in their lap and they commit suicide in the parking lot of the VA, I think that's a pretty staunch statement that we're not being treated right. I agree. I was in Arizona at the V8 Arizona in Phoenix when uh, the soldiers were dying in the waiting room of the emergency room, laying in the floor. Yep. And how disgusting is that, that our nation and our leaders are allowing that to happen. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you saw the interview, but John Stewart just interviewed the lady in charge of the DOD and asked her, where are all these billions of dollars that you can't uh, uh, give us a record of where it's been spent? Where, where's all this money going? It's not going to the enlisted uh, service people that are having to uh, supplement their income by getting food stamps food stamps in America for somebody that's serving for our military. That's unbelievable to me. And it, it, Stewart has taken her to task and told her that uh, it's it's not right. It's not right that you 61% uh, of the budget, you can't tell us where the money is. That's wrong. And it, it, everybody should say it's wrong. I think that, again, it's where People are so overwhelmed in their own lives in, um, because they have such tremendous stress also. You know, we have, um, I don't know, I don't want to get too political. 
losing jobs, so many people that can't um, get help, and, you know, with the COVID that happened, um, yeah. you know, and of course there's those people that will take advantage when they can take advantage. And so it's usually the ones that are honest and good and hardworking that do get left behind. And that's our soldiers. Our soldiers are duty bound. They take an oath. <laughs> If they considered the cost of the care of the veterans after the war in their budgets, they'd never have another war. But I don't think it's the government. I think it's the outside sources that want to test the new stuff and, you know, they make money off of war. Well, if you look at the profits of General Dynamics, for instance, <laughs> I've been recently looking at stock market and I can look at General Dynamics. It's a huge military supplier and it's almost at a 45 degree angle of their stock and the price and how far it's gone up. The military industrial complex is real. And oh, yeah. Hungry. I can, I, I, and, and that's it. It's that it's changed. It's really changed. And, um, I know I was hearing about that. They're thinking about making the draft again and also making it an automatic for the females to be a draft. And, um, you know, there's a lot of veterans that are saying under this administration, no way they're going to rebel against it and especially having uh their daughters go they're going to rebel against it and it's sad that that you know because when i don't know when you did but i'm i have an idea that when we took our oath and went in it was something we took seriously we didn't know when we would go to war we didn't know if we would get hurt we didn't know anything we knew that we wanted to serve our country and the values that it stood for. But our country is so torn on values just in itself. I traded it's how can we come together. for a college career. <laughs> That's why I joined. That was one of the <laughs> biggest reasons that I joined the Coast Guard was because they were going to put me through college. Uh -huh. Did you? And I knew there was no way my mom was going to be able to put me through college. My mom raised three of us on her own, so I knew that if I was ever going to get to go to college, I'd have to do something. <laughs> right. And so you and, did go to college? Oh, yeah. I went awesome. uh, while I was on active duty, too. When I was stationed in London, I got my associate's degree from the University of Maryland, European Division. Interesting. And then when I got out of the service, I went back to college with a buddy of mine that got out of the Marine Corps, and he and I went to Florida State. And I graduated with a degree in international affairs and a minor in political science. Uh -huh, so that's why you keep up with the political items. Yep. <laughs> I get it. Okay. So he didn't um, graduate. <laughs> oh, he didn't? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's too bad on his end. <laughs> um <laughs> but I did. <laughs> well, that's good for you. Work for and I you. Put that's the main thing. I put everything in storage and moved to the West Coast. <laughs> I didn't now, even go to I didn't even go to graduation. Oh wow. Yeah. I was Well, ready. I was born in Oregon. So the West Coast is pretty much all I know. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's beautiful. I miss the, I miss my fairy forest, if that makes sense. Yeah. I do. Um, now, I'm going to get a little bit more personal with you. Okay. And again, you do not have to answer any of it. Uh, you can decline. But I would like to know... When you got out, I, you just shared that you went to college, but how did you adjust 
I mean, there's that point of when you get out, you got the freedom. Yay. You know, nobody's going to tell me what time to wake up, what time to go to bed, you know, that kind of a thought system. But I think the inside. military taught me discipline. And so when I went to college, I, I was disciplined about going to college. So you just didn't have any kind of an adjustment of, of I stayed in lost. while I was going to college. I was on reserves. I did reserve duty in Panama City, Florida. Ah. So while I was on active duty, I was uh, while I was going to college, I was still doing reserve duty on the weekends. Got and you. I worked in uh, on campus. Uh, they had a, uh, a veteran, uh, you could get paid by the VA to be a volunteer and uh, work in um, veteran affairs office. So I did that. It's a work study program. And with work study, you get paid and it's non-taxable. It's not considered income. Oh, so that was a little added uh, advantage. And also one of the things I found out when I was going to college, I applied for uh, federal grants and I wouldn't get any because they would base it on my previous income. And that really bothered me because I'm no longer on active duty. Why can you uh, not consider that I'm not uh, making any money now? I want you to base it on uh, expected income, not previous income. And I found out that there's a, uh, a question that you can answer in the uh, uh, financial aid forms that makes it based on future income and not previous income. And after I figured that out, I got grants. I got free money to go to college while I was going to college. <laughs> and that so was great. You I didn't know anything about getting grants until I started to uh, research it and find out more. So what would you recommend for somebody that just got out? Um, let's say they just got back from Afghanistan. Um, they're feeling pretty lost. They've been, you know, through a lot of trauma like you did. Um, and they don't really have a plan. They have, a family, so they're focusing on how they're going to support. Um, you fall what, back what, on your military training and you put one foot in front of the other until you figure it out. Any places that you would recommend for them to go and get help? Uh, veteran service officers. That's a good one. I always keep forgetting about them people. They're the ones that uh, uh, can do a lot for you. They're your admin people, really. They're the ones that file your paperwork. They're the ones that can find out where your paperwork is. They can find out if it's been held up. And they can file paperwork to get that moved. So that if you're waiting for a, uh, a, a, a disability to be approved or not, and sometimes it'll just get stuck somewhere. And a veteran service officer, a VSO, is the one you go talk to to find out. That's great. I appreciate you mentioning that because they do do a lot. And um, they are there for the soldier, for sure, or the veteran itself. And I think you can look that up on the state. I, I know that. Have, I'm a peer support specialist, too. Oh. I got this one. From Portland Community College. Awesome. And I so was we doing, can... uh, I was getting uh, paid for schooling from Voc Rehabilitation. That's another way that if you want to continue your education and you've exhausted your military benefits, that you can get more money. Voc Rehab, Vocational Rehabilitation. That is a good one, too. I appreciate that. See, these are all tips that I don't remember. I mean, um, and if, you know, young people that are getting out, I don't think they're being told about it. Or if they are, 
it's so overwhelming as you get out of the service you but just don't remember it's like a lot of things if you want that information you got to find out and do it yourself <laughs> when i moved out here to the west coast and i started finding out about uh veteran groups that do fishing and hunting i researched it i did five pages of groups that, that take veterans on these trips i disseminated that information to many many people so that more could take advantage of these groups i don't know why we don't have a main page or something in our system that we can all all the veteran groups are listed in one place. They they can't do that. Um, the volunteers are set up through voluntary services. And voluntary services cannot uh, lend credence to one group over another group. Okay? They've got to be neutral. And so they pretty much ban them all. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. There's only well, one project, Healing Waters, that I know of that it's ever been allowed into the VA. Huh. Yeah. Well, I think then somebody that's a computer smart should make a program on Facebook or something like that. that there, a is a, there is a VA app, Lisa. You can download the VA app. I use it all the time. I use it to send emails to my doctors. I send it to a uh, um, pharmacy. I ask questions and they have to answer. They can't just blow you off. This is a written documentation where you're asking a question. It's not like many things where they just go, well, I didn't see it, right? Yeah. They have to see this and they have to answer. And so it's a very powerful tool for you to get uh, the things that you need. And we need to advocate for ourselves. And a lot of times uh, we don't do that. In fact, I recently had some cancer uh, surgeries. And it's because the nurse uh, chastised me and told me that I needed to advocate for myself and get to go see a dermatologist and then have it uh, determined whether it was uh uh, basal cell carcinoma, uh, cancer, or not cancer. Right. I mean, then that's true because that's where a lot of us, I know I waited uh, when I got out um, a couple of years later, I applied for the disability, was denied. And and it's been 25 years. It's, it's and delayed. I reapply, and I hope they die. And through the VA. Huh? <laughs> That's a, the VA model is delayed. Well, I was told denied, by one of the veterans in our community that, yeah, that they had um, changed a lot of the rules for females. And so to reapply. And. Um, yes. Thankfully, I did, and I got a lot of help, and I was I I got my my uh, rating disability. So, um, you know, it's it's amazing that you know you feel guilty because that's how I felt was uh, oh, there's so many more that need this more than I do. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just. And I, I was convinced once I talked to somebody, no, your journey is different than somebody else's journey. And it doesn't make you any less or them any less. And so um, I went ahead and went for it. And I'm very thankful for it. I mean, well, that's I another thing it. that not many people know about uh, how to apply for a disability. It's, do you know? how much paperwork it is yep. and the wording has to be just precise that's why I'm somebody always, like me i'm always trying to learn new things and one day i heard about the term nexus letter i'd never heard that term a nexus letter well what a nexus letter is it's just a letter from your doctor that ties two things together 
for me, it was sleep apnea and PTSD. And with the doctor, I had her do this letter. And then I had uh, a bunch of buddy statements. And I reapplied to have my disability increase, tying my sleep apnea to my PTSD. And yeah, it's crazy. I had to learn about all that stuff because I didn't know anything about it. You need to research yourself. If you hear a word like nexus letter and you don't know what it is, find out what it is. You have a well, computer here's in the your situation. hands in your phone. You can look up anything at any time. But here's the thing that I, I, okay, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate. Okay, go. Okay. What if the veteran has severe depression? Your cognitive thinking isn't working. It's not going to process. That's when you, you know, need a social worker. There we a, go. You need a an VA advocate to stand. Social worker that can handle these things that your uh, your cognitive disabilities uh, should be eased by a social worker. I agree. And a lot of times they don't know that that can even be uh, available because there are a lot of veterans that end up um, getting hooked on drugs, alcohol, um, and their cognitive is not there. Um, the depression is overtaking. And so it can, it, it, you know, or their injuries. Yeah. Just their injuries alone. I mean, what if well, they have? Look at, well, look at, uh, I told you I have sleep apnea and I have PTSD. I don't mm -hmm. even sleep with my wife anymore, Lisa. I can't. I did a sleep study with the VA. My legs move over 100 times an hour. It's not conducive for me to have somebody in the same bed with me. Now, no. what that does, it's like me running all night long. It puts yes. pressure on my heart, and it's going to make me die earlier because of my service. Yeah. So oh, yeah. that's why you have the right to ask for uh, disability, uh, because in a lot of cases, your life is going to be altered or shortened because of your military service. Right. But there's so many that say, well, you volunteered or you were drafted and it's on you. It's not our responsibility, the United States or citizens, to have to pay taxes for you to get money. <laughs> you have to take care of those that are keeping you free. But freedom isn't a, a, a thing that's even... Freedom isn't free. No, and the, but the problem is, is what if they don't want to be free? What if they want the system to take care of them, not make any decisions? Let the government take care of me. Find a government that will. That's what I think. But <laughs> <laughs> and if it ain't America, see you later. <laughs> well, you know, that's, I think, where we need to be. I, I, you know, I'm broken on that because I'm, I'm going to be 61. So <laughs> a part of me is like, yeah, that's a no brainer. But the other part of me is like, but well, it's our responsibility to educate, you know, and to pass this information down. And like you do, you're, you have that heart to make sure that that's being done for our veterans. Even though the community may not be doing it, I, I hear it. All the time that I've been volunteering since 2008, um, all the people, all the groups, the people that help veterans are other veterans. The people that help veterans the most are other veterans. Yes, sir. I mean, nothing but a veteran can understand what a veteran's going through. Right. They may not have experienced it, but they know the system. They know how it will work together. We, I always say, we all sign the same dotted line. Yeah, we did. That's and right. you know what? Even though I've we've said some negative issues about our system, I cannot say honestly that I regret. I do not regret one moment 
of joining the United States Army. And they, the overall changed my life and made it better. Yeah. Even though there was issues that I experienced that I'll carry for the rest of my life. Overall, I'm still very proud to have been a member of the military. I feel the same way. I mean, I was 19 years old being called a hero. What kid doesn't want to grow up and be a hero? I had exactly. the opportunity. I was a hero. I'm still a hero. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yes. And I think right. that's pretty cool. I do, too. I do, too. Well, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to start uh, winding down here. I have not, you know what? I have not checked to see if anybody's asked any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so much into us talking. Oh, good. Nobody's asked any questions. <laughs> Ooh, I'm not that bad. I just was informed today that my official title is a DJ. Isn't that exciting? That is. I'm like, I would have never, ever thought of myself as a DJ, but. DJ Lisa K. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. I got to make a commercial about that. Yeah. That's right. You write that down because <laughs> you're going to forget it. <laughs> what is it called? DJ? With Lisa K. With Lisa K. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, you're good. I might have to hire you to do me some ad libs for commercials and there stuff like go. that. <laughs> oh, you know what, Greg? I am so happy that I saw you and um that you were wanting to do another program and it just fit right in with me starting up again and um again if you have anything in the future that you want to share or um you know talk about please let me know i'll have you back on here anytime well i've been, i've done some other programs uh I was uh, on the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs Service Dog Task Force with my previous dog. And uh, I did a couple of radio programs with a friend of mine that's uh, over in Portland, Oregon. And he was a uh, Vietnam uh, Marine Corps gunny sergeant. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he and I are buddies. And I've done a couple of programs on his radio show, just trying to get the word out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you all because I'm still learning where this is going to be broadcast all, but I'll get the information. But I was just excited that, uh, well, I think one of them is iHeartRadio yep. and Apple Radio. And, of course, then all the other destinations, VRS. Um, MBS. Oh, my gosh. Hmm? Military Broadcast Syndicate, MBS. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we're cooking with oil. And I'm and working on, just um, I'm trying to get uh, British radio broadcasting system to rebroadcast. Oh, you need to, I need to put you in touch with MBR, uh, the owner. Um, he's, he's so right on with everything on that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he could because probably... He these, a, a lot of these situations and the things that we're discussing aren't native to just America. It's the same with other militaries. The Canadians have had people die. Other countries that have been involved in the wars that we've been involved in, they've had people that have died. We have yeah. veterans all over the world. So why not open it up to all veterans in the world? I agree. I agree completely. Well, I am going to go ahead... And I want to make sure I do my closing correctly. So we are going to, <laughs> I got to look at my notes because if I don't, I will mess it up. Ah. Oh, I had it here. Oh, okay. The next show coming up is Slacker 82 Alpha. And I have not personally seen his program. But from what I've heard, he is really awesome. And uh, so don't miss out on that. Remember, veterans support veterans. 
and please support MBR, spread the word. And um, we do have a app in its MBR on the apps, whatever that app store, you know, the A. I don't know terminology. This is, this is, I'm granny. Okay. This is just who I am. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I just found out we have an app. So um, go to our app, load it down. You could see our schedule. You could see me. And you can see the show with Craig, and you can also pass it along. And I really, again, thank you, Craig. Have a fabulous night. Give your wife a hello for me. And next time, you'll have to show the picture of a trip. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All righty, gang. Again, I appreciate you being here and please, oh, please spread the word and let's keep on, um, you know, doing what we need to do as far as keeping our veterans safe, um, passing on the information and be well. And if you have any questions, you could go ahead and contact the station and we will reach back out to you with any kind of information that we have and get you the help or listen to you. And if you have any suggestions on uh, shows that you would like me to talk about and find out information, let me know. I'll go and find them and see what I can do. All right. This is Granny Lisa. And again, don't miss Slacker 82 Alpha. They're coming up next. Thank you. Ah, there we go.